Hello, Sublation Media viewers, readers, and listeners. It's me again, Douglas Lane. And in this video, I'll be trying to explain why it is that it's so difficult to have a good sense of yourself, of who you are and who you want to be. And along the way, I'll explain what the Slovenian philosopher Slovoj Žižek means when he talks about the ticklish subject. You are at the center of a contradiction. For over 200 years, through a process of industrialization, technological advance, and liberalization, people like you have been pulled in opposing directions. No matter when or where you were born, your identity, the one you're supposed to have, can be traced back to America in the 1950s. There's even a chart where the process of your development is all laid out. In 1956, back when Elvis couldn't be shown from the waist down on television, the psychoanalyst Eric Erickson wrote it down in an essay entitled The Problem of Ego Identity. He enumerated the stages you are meant to go through. According to Erickson, you are or were supposed to start asking yourself certain questions sometime between the ages of 16 and 22. Questions that, when answered, would or will give you a sense of how you fit into the world. Consider the life of a teenager. Huh? You have parents and teachers telling you what to do. You have movies, magazines, and TV telling you what to do. But you know what you have to do. Huh? Your job, your purpose, is to get accepted, get a cute girlfriend, to think up something great to do for the rest of your life. Again, in order to become mentally well, you're supposed to be or become somebody. On the other hand, you have to be flexible. You shouldn't just learn one thing, take up something that you're good at and perfect your skill, but rather you should be malleable, moldable, teachable. You should be ready to do anything for anybody at any time. Don't just pick out one job, but get ready to work. Don't just pick out one girl or boy to love, but become sexy, desirable, for and according to everyone. You're meant to become somebody. You're also supposed to be everybody. This contradiction makes it difficult to figure out who you are. These opposing sets of instructions that leave you feeling confused aren't just being pulled from the air. Nobody is giving you arbitrary or wrong advice. The problem is not that Hollywood is selling you the idea that you can be anybody and everybody when you should be rooted, committed, and responsible. The problem is not some red state hick preacher making you feel guilty for not settling down, for being bisexual or pansexual or a girl when you were born a boy. The problem is, in this crazy world, there are good reasons to be both flexible and fixed. There are reasons to be really skilled at one particular thing, and there are reasons to be de-skilled and ready to try anything. Our world is built upon a very complex and specific division of labor. As technology advances, there's both more and more of a need for specialized knowledge and skill, and also there's a need for less and less specialization. There's a need for workers who can move, who can surf one economic crisis after another. There's a need for mobility and a willingness to make yourself useful in any given industry. That's how you survive. Unless there's a need for you not to survive. That happens too. Eric Erickson only outlined one side of the dilemma. His stages of psychosocial development were written at a time when conforming to social expectations involved becoming a company man. You could rely on job security, automatic cost of living raises, a pension, and the prospect of getting ahead in your chosen industry if you hunkered down, followed the rules, and worked hard to learn and improve. But rather than being the norm, post-war capitalism was unique. In general, the capitalist system requires that workers adjust to a precarious life. As Karl Marx said in his essay, Wages, written for the journal Socialist Economy in 1847, big industry constantly requires a reserve army of unemployed workers 
for times of overproduction. The main purpose of the bourgeois in relation to the worker is, of course, to have the commodity labor as cheaply as possible, which is only possible when the supply of this commodity is as large as it can be in relation to the demand for it. In general, our industrial society needs a lot of people who are unemployed, desperate for work, and willing to live off low wages or scraps in order to survive. Erickson's suggestion that we should form an ego identity in adolescence doesn't fit into a society wherein many workers cannot afford to be overly committed to any particular company, job, or skill. Instead, the reserve army is truly the embodiment of abstract labor. They are nothing more than their potential to work, their potential energy that may or may not be put into action one day. They are like a Duracell battery left aside in a drawer in case the lights go out. Erickson didn't know about the Matrix. He charted the stages of human development during an era defined by gray flannel and trust and authority. But as early as 1971, he was troubled by how the society around him was failing to live up to his vision, failing to provide the stability and sense of self-significance that was necessary if you were to transition from adolescence into young adulthood and beyond. He was especially troubled by the mistreatment of African Americans who was moved by their collective struggle for equality and acceptance in an America defined by whiteness. He was interested in Huey Newton, the head of the Black Panther Party, and in 1971, he managed to meet the young radical. Their conversation was recorded and transcribed into a book, and what was said still resonates today, even as it presents an unresolved problem. For example, in 2020, Sylvain Zizek spoke about this meeting between Eric Erickson and Huey Newton on a panel that was convened on the topic of identity politics. A panel convened while protests against the police violence raged in the streets in the wake of the murder of George Floyd. In 1971, Eric Erickson brought his ideas about psychosocial development and ego identities to the Black Panther Huey Newton, and he hoped that he could help the Black Panthers find a way to both fit into America and transform America. Today, however, Erickson's notion of adolescence as a time when one overcomes an identity crisis and forms an ego identity, the psychological stage wherein one comes of age and fits into the social world, has been challenged by a variety of other theories, including Zizek's. In 1972, Huey Newton had a dialogue with Eric Erikson, the Freud and psychoanalyst who was deeply sympathetic, white guy, old white guy from Europe, but deeply sympathetic to the Black Panthers. And uh, here is what Huey Newton said. I admire this. Quote, we believe that there are no more colonies or neo-colonies. If a people is colonized, it must be possible for them to decolonize and become what they formerly were. But what happens when the raw materials are extracted and labor is exploited within a territory dispersed over the entire globe. When the riches of the whole earth are depleted and used to feed a gigantic industrial machine. Then the people and the economy are so integrated into the imperialist empire that it's impossible to decolonize, to return to the former conditions of existence. If colonies cannot decolonize and return to their original existence as nations, then nations no longer exist, nor, we believe, will they ever exist again, and so on, and so on. That's where we are today. The problem of uh, identity politics, where I have a problem with it, is that it presupposes that, how should I put it, that identities exist. I don't think they exist. When Zizek says that he doesn't believe that our identities exist, he is proposing that instead of expecting our subjectivity to be integrated peacefully into the social order that surrounds us, we should instead accept the anxiety-producing absence as our identity. When Zizek wrote of the tickler subject, 
he was pointing to how our subjective understanding has apparently gone missing in a world without a stable social order. But he was also arguing from the perspective of a philosopher. He was returning to the old chestnut from Descartes, reiterating the phrase, I think, therefore I am. Who would have us recall that the foundation of knowledge for Descartes was doubt. Descartes wanted to doubt everything that could be doubted, and he wanted to do this in an effort to discover what, if anything, he would not be able to doubt. Descartes posited a variety of reasons to doubt his senses. For instance, he suggested that you can't be sure about what you're seeing or feeling because you might be dreaming. He went further and argued that one couldn't be sure about abstract reason either. Descartes posited the idea of an evil demon, a creature with the power to implant illusions into your head and make you believe, for example, that one plus one equals three. There was no reason to be sure that an evil demon did not, in fact, exist. In the end, all that Descartes found that he could really be certain about was the fact of his doubt. And that's the meaning behind his proposition, I think, therefore I am. However, this leaves the thinking subject in a difficult position. It is only through doubting the reality of the world outside of himself that the Cartesian Cogito can arrive at the truth. And that truth is only doubt itself. We can see how unsatisfactory this is as a final resting place for our identity, an identity that we use to act upon the world, an identity that can create political change by returning to Huey Newton. Newton, in 1971, was stuck with an anxious, doubting identity. And this meant that he was unable to create a political project that could go beyond the moment of doubt or go beyond the purely negative reaction to the racist America he'd been thrown into. Newton decided that the radical subject in 1971, the ego identity that could not only find a position within American society, but could also change it, was the lumpen position. The lumpen proletariat are the segments of the reserve army of the proletariat who have been made permanently unemployable. Whether their subaltern position is due to societal racism, geographic location, or the ravages of underemployment itself, the lumpen proletariat are the unemployed workers who are no longer on reserve, but who are considered disposable. The lumpen are precisely those who have taken their negative position up as an identity. This means that when Huey Newton defined himself and the Black Panthers as lumpen, he was giving away too much. To put it differently, to take up the lumpen position as an identity puts you in the position of a subject who enters what Hegel defines as the dark night of the world, but only partially. You protect yourself from the disintegration, preserve a criminal identity as a final refuge from the doubt that really defines you. However, Zizek does offer another strategy other than reification of the negative. Rather than cynically embracing the lumpen position, one can over-identify with the normative bourgeois identity that is being sold to you. In contingency, hegemony, universality, contemporary dialogues on the left, Zizek wrote, the political consequence I draw from this notion of inherent transgression is that one has to abandon the idea that power operates in the mode of identification, so that the privileged form of resistance to power should involve a politics of disidentification. Because a minimum of disidentification is a priori necessary if power is to function. Power can reproduce itself only through some form of self-distance, by relying on the obscene, disavowed rules and practices that are in conflict with its public norms. What Zizek is saying here is that it is not by maintaining a cynical distance from the social order, by pretending to operate outside of it and by different rules, that one can overcome the social order, but rather by taking up the promise of society, by insisting 
that the social order lives up to its own rules. One can both organize politically and overcome the old rules by finding their true limits. This idea might explain why it is that the lumpen left has had so many failures lately, explain why it is that the bourgeois journalists who cling to old-fashioned ideas about fairness, free speech, reason, cooperation, and even the free market are more feared by the state than cynical Marxists who have no time for such relics as the Constitution and who know in advance that the world is corrupt. Today's leftist accepts his downtrodden position as inevitable. He looks the other way as the Department of Homeland Security keeps him under surveillance and tells him what he can and cannot say, while the naive journalist presumes that society should live up to its own standards. The naive journalist ends up bringing the corruption of society into the light. Those who believe in the freedom that is promised to us are the only ones who can discover and confirm the reality of our unfreedom without reifying it, adjusting to it, and ultimately supporting or confirming it. When we ask ourselves who we are, what kind of people we want to be in this precarious world that attempts to force us to be everyone and no one, we still have the opportunity to answer the question this way. I'm a revolutionary, as were my father and mother who brought me into this world. I was born into a society in the midst of an ongoing transformation. And I mean to realize this world for myself and for my brothers and sisters. If you enjoyed this conversation, please do consider supporting us on Patreon. Our patrons help to make sure that Sublation Media can continue to provide interviews, videos, books, and articles that are critical of the left from the left. If you are tired of remaining stuck within bourgeois ideologies and politics, help us sublate them both. <laughs>